The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the fragility of the health system as resources are spread thin. Our frontline healthcare workers are the backbone of the health system. A dysfunctional healthcare worker equates to a dysfunctional healthcare system and reduced healthcare service delivery to the people of the country. Our frontline healthcare workers are at high risk for developing mental health problems, which include depression and suicide. They work long hours in a high pressure environment. They encounter sickness and death daily. These already challenging working conditions are further compounded by the underlying bullying, mistreatment, and discrimination that is inherent to the medical profession. This is a look behind the front line. I'll just take you through um, a certain incident that occurred on a ward round uh, where I had been incorrect about a diagnosis for a patient. Um, the consultant in question went on to tell me that um, I'm stupid and um, I would need a prayer for my career if I were to continue in medicine. And um, later on within the same ward round, similar incident where she discarded one of my colleagues' notes, drew a line through it and threw the notes on the floor, asked for somebody more competent to come and re the patient. Um, after this ward round, I felt so, um, felt so belittled. I just went home and I just cried. I felt like um, for the ensuing weeks, uh, as though I were sort of an imposter, as it were. Um, I was just coming to work for the sake of coming to work, but I didn't really feel like I was a doctor within the group. Um, somebody who was constantly questioning my validity to be there. So when I started specialization, I realized that there were already subtle differences. And initially I tried to sort of brush it off, you know, water off a duck's back kind of thing. But it became more pronounced in certain areas over certain times with specific individuals. Um, people also believed they could intimidate you by um, you know, being quite rude to you, saying, well, you're a female of color, you're not wanted here. Sometimes there is a bit of a gray zone when it comes to bullying, abuse and mistreatment, where someone is in a situation and they feel uncomfortable, but they're not sure why or how. And they have been met with, well, we all go through this. We've all been through that, so just suck it up and move on. If you look at definitions currently in South Africa with the labor law is that bullying falls under harassment and there is a difference between bullying and harassment. With harassment, one incident, you can go legally and act against this person and the harassment is normally um, linked to a certain characteristic of a person like gender, race, disability. But if you look at bullying, bullying is not visible. You can't pinpoint it. One of the problems with um, putting your finger on bullying is it's often subtle and political. And so for somebody else hearing about it, you don't um, appreciate the pattern that's developing. And I think for me, um, one of the key signs is actually um, seeing the effect on the person involved. So if the person is scared, if they're intimidated, it's, it's actually seeing the person who's experiencing it. The, the constant demeaning and undermining um, is a lot and people like myself, you know, often have to perform and prove that we are who we are because the assumption is you are not. So I think some of the reasons that people don't come forward out of fear of victimization is because of the fact that the medical profession is so hierarchical in nature. And so during internship, there's a logbook that needs to get signed. And so every speciality that you rotate through, the HOD needs to sign off to say that you've completed this adequately. And if they don't sign off, they can either make you repeat the whole block, so four months, and therefore extend your internship, or they can make it such that you are tainted for the rest of the other disciplines and cannot complete your internship at all. And so sometimes people will absorb all of this mistreatment, absorb all of this bullying, absorb all of this abuse, 
because of fear of their own safety and their own careers. I was very nearly done with university when I somehow ended up in a group of students who were all female. Um, we went to a tutorial one afternoon and one of the first remarks that the doctor, who was male, um, made was, I don't know why I bother teaching you because you're all going to end up getting married, having kids, dropping out of medicine, and that spot could have gone to a male student. You know, medicine has very well-known and well-documented gender and racial biases. Um, and I think that not only just affects patients, but it affects even the young students in the medical schools and how they are taught medicine. It's people's attitudes, you know. Every day, uh, registrars are asked, I know in one of the hospitals, are you on contraceptives? Did you people remember your pill today? And these things are being said out in public in front of patients even. What about the dignity of those women, you know? But I do think it's a lot about um, the boys club, you know, how medicine is still seen as a men's field and all these women are now coming in. And some specialities don't want to take women at all. They will go as far as telling you that we, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't take women here. You know, medicine has a long history of patriarchy and um, doctors knowing better. And I think the idea of being patriarchal toward patients and the patriarchy actually ties in together quite nicely. Um, and in the same era that we've started saying um, patients should have autonomy, um, it's the same era that we've started saying that women are more equal. The medical community can be quite resistant to change. And I think we've seen that in our careers and in our hospitals and in the way that we treat patients and the way that we treat our female colleagues or our gender non-conforming colleagues or our non-binary colleagues. Being a medical doctor, the hours that you're expected to work, you don't work at the same level of competence at three o'clock in the morning. Um, you can't be expected to feel the same level of compassion when you're drained and exhausted. So it's no secret that some of the hours that junior doctors work are purely and utterly unacceptable. Um, sometimes as long as 36 hours. Uh, other issues that come up quite often are issues of sexual harassment. Um, because of the fact that medicine is still largely male dominated, we have a lot of complaints coming through about how interns and junior doctors are being mistreated and being victims and survivors of sexual misconduct in the workplace, which is completely unacceptable. Um, you can be called one time to come and certify, you know, uh, a person who has just died. The, the next moment you, in the labor ward, someone else has been born. The next minute you're in a resuscitation and putting someone else in an ICU. It, it's, it's a whole thing. And we cannot, you know, forget that doctors are humans. Um, and so where do we go for, for that comfort, for debriefing, for the support? Um, and I think that's what often leads to the being emotionally depleted. And then you come off as cold. Um, but how else will you cope? if you are not putting the distance between you and whatever else is happening um, so that you can be productive. Because remember, if you take 30 minutes to go cry, the people in the queue are going to get upset because now they need their chronic medicines. Um, and I think patients forget often that the, the, the complaints they have about the health system are the complaints that the doctors are complaining about. Bullying, discrimination and harsh working conditions contribute to increasing mental health problems in healthcare workers. I was diagnosed with generalised anxiety disorder. It was around about April time after I finished my first rotation. Um, I've always had some degree of anxiety. I think it's related to wanting to be a perfectionist, wanting to do things in the right way. And anxiety can be helpful in that sense. It helps you progress, it helps you become successful. But I think it's just reached a new level where it's now become debilitating. 
because I'm suffering from panic attacks at work, the prospect of going to theatre is daunting for me. I sometimes break out in cold sweats during operations and I have to ask to sit out, which is embarrassing for me as well. But um, it's a physiological response to a trigger, a mental trigger. Medical students are at high risk of developing mental health disorders during their training. We reported a rate of one in four students, medical students, being diagnosed with depressive disorder um, and one in five being diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Over a third of students were at risk for depressive disorder and just under half for an anxiety disorder, which is quite shocking for us to see. If you look at some psychological, your um, physical, emotional issues that is developing from a nursing um, professional or a doctor is the whole thing about the burnout or something that is that sometimes happen is is depression and also even suicide. Rates of depression are increasing amongst healthcare workers. Suicide can be considered an occupational risk. Mental health is a big problem. I've never, ever, ever received any form of debriefing um, in the eight years that I was in the public sector. Um, working in emergency pediatric units, you can imagine the type of patient profiles um, that you are getting. Working in a, a post-rape um, care units also, you, you can just imagine the type of trauma that we were having to listen to every day and assist patients through, yet there was no care and support um, you know, for those personnel. So really, I think what, what the system expects of the humans in it is, is completely um, unreasonable. Um, and I think it does contribute to the exhaustion, to the burnout, um, to the fatigue that people are arriving already at work feeling, you know. If you've ever had a loved one who's been depressed or who's been anxious, you know, they're not themselves. They don't pay as much attention to you. And one of the problems with depression and anxiety is that you can't concentrate as well as you could. So it's quite obvious that that would affect your ability to take care of other people. I think an important um, delineation to note is not necessarily that doctors with mental illness are insufficient or incapable um, just by virtue of having mental illness, but when they have a mental illness and don't take responsibility for that to seek help and to get better, then perhaps their function is reduced and perhaps their performance and their patient-centeredness does take a hit. And it's just about finding that balance where we acknowledge and accept mental illness as real and evident and occurrent. And it's not necessarily the only thing that makes doctors bad, mm. but just the fact that we don't have an environment that normalizes this and that is conducive to seeking help that may then lead to things becoming really bad. Some of these issues have a significant uh, impact on the delivery of healthcare in the country and I think that that's the one part that we would like to emphasize is that an unsafe or an unacceptable working environment can have huge impacts on the mental health of the people in that system, be it junior doctors, be it nursing staff, be it any of the health professionals functioning within that system. And so it goes to say that if you're health professionals, if the people who are delivering healthcare on the ground are unhappy, are depressed, then this can lead to things like absenteeism, burnout, it can lead to mental health issues, and all of these can impact the quality of healthcare delivered to the patients. And so one realizes that the unsafe working conditions of junior doctors and of every other health professional actually have a direct impact on the quality of healthcare that the system can deliver. When I first started in that role of being in a headship, um, I had to learn a lot of things about myself. And one of the biggest things I learned was how easy it was to fall back into habits that you didn't want to do. And it so easily became there at the tip of your tongue to say, 
well, I work 36 hours, so you should work 36 hours. What are you complaining about? And it's very easy to default into that mode. And I, it was one of the biggest things I had to do initially was to stop myself, was to learn how to say, if somebody is complaining about working a Friday, Sunday, take a step back and ask yourself why. How did you feel when you worked a Friday, Sunday? Is there something you can change? Is there something you can do differently? The other thing I always tell the registrars is that, that life happens. It happens to all of us. Today, it could be my mum that is sick and I need to leave work early to go and help her out. Tomorrow, it could be your mum. But life happens and there's a circle that goes around. It will all come around again. We all work in this environment where you will do a little bit extra today and next month, somebody else has to do a little bit extra for you. Um, and people often forget that. If it's often sort of this, well, you're here and you expected to be here and you can't just leave and your whole life is about being a doctor and, and being in medicine and if you have a family crisis, somebody else must deal with it and that's not right. We're all human beings at the end of the day. The with the Protection of Harassment Act, basically what you can do is that you go to a magistrate court, you can apply a protection order against a person who is bullying you. With that is that employers will begin to realize that this is a reality. Now it's my responsibility and it's not only the victim's responsibility. Medicine as a whole, as much as it needs to be looking outwards, it needs to start looking inwards and saying, where are the rotten spots and how can we fix it? Not how can we cover up the rotten spot? Because then we're not going to grow. And medicine can grow as much as it wants to scientifically, but if it doesn't grow socially and morally, then it's a dead profession. Because if you look at the problems, they don't need more money. They need more leadership. They need more commitment. They need accountability. If we had someone from the College of Medicine South Africa, from any of the disciplines, stand up and say, listen, this is what's happening and we need to stop it. It would, it would make a huge impact because these are the key figures that we all look up to. In conversation with management and administrators is really to then now start brainstorming what do we have the resources to do now? Um, are we doing treatment at the end of a problem? Um, so like upscaling number of counsellors, upscaling access to psychiatrists and psychologists, or are we also trying to plow into prevention um, and in that way looking at the environment and the social and the psychological. The Healthcare Workers Care Network has been formed as a response to the mental health struggles that healthcare workers go through. We are a team of over 500 mental health providers in South Africa, whom in combination with SADAC, SAMA, SASA and SASA aim to provide accessible, free mental health support for our fellow healthcare workers. We aim to provide a preventative psychoeducational arm of support, as well as a free confidential helpline and counselling service for all healthcare workers. Bullying, discrimination and harsh working conditions in the medical profession affect the mental health and well-being of our frontline healthcare workers. This in turn directly affects the quality of healthcare given to the people of the country. It is our collective responsibility to protect them.